Welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, where we discuss all things Bible and theology. Because it matters, what you really believe determines how you really behave. Now, here is your host, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and Professor of Bible and Theology for the National Theological College and Graduate School, Dr. Paul Weaver. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is that you're listening to this program. I'm your host, Paul Weaver, and today we are continuing our podcast series on the world religions. In our last episodes, we discussed animism, Hinduism, Judaism, and Islam. In this episode and in the next episode, we will be discussing the subject of Buddhism. And to discuss Buddhism, I am very pleased to have Dr. Scott Harrell, on the podcast. Dr. Harrell retired just this past year after 25 years of serving on the faculty of Dallas Theological Seminary. He earned the title of Senior Professor of Theological Studies. As most of our retired professors, he continues as an adjunct professor for DTS. He is also an adjunct professor at the Seminario Teologico Centroamericano in Guatemala, adjunct professor for Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary, in Amman, Jordan. Prior to joining the faculty of Dallas Theological Seminary, he was a missionary in Brazil. He was involved in church planting, work as well as teaching at several theological schools, including the Word of Life Seminary in Atabaia, Brazil. Dr. Hurrell has taught a course on the world religions for a total of 30 years, which makes him the perfect guest for this podcast episode. Dr. Hurrell, welcome to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast. Thank you, Paul. It's very good to be with you. Well, before we get to the history of Buddhism, would you help us to understand the scope of Buddhism around the world? Yeah, there's quite a few publications that help us here. One from the Lausanne organization. Buddhism is considered the fourth largest religion in the world, but it bleeds into so many other religions. There's syncretism on every side with Taoism, Confucianism, ancestral worship, really even Hinduism, New Age, the list goes on and on. There are about 550 million Buddhists in the world. Traditionally, that's been located, especially in Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar. Those have been the primary centers of all this, Sri Lanka to some extent, but it certainly spreads out from there. Buddhism, even in Mongolia, the Tibetan kind of Buddhism, into, of course, Nepal today, and probably quite a remnant yet in what is now China, taking over Tibet. We see Buddhism on all sides. Of course, it's, we'll talk about its history of migration and all of that, but China, Korea, South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, very strong. These are centers of Buddhism around the world. And I would say they're the hardest of all for Christians to reach mm. because when you ask the big questions of life, they are the polar opposite of what a monotheistic and certainly Trinitarian religion would be. So, Paul, what I, I often do in my classes on religion is to go back to the really big questions of life, and the categories play out fairly easily. And I typically take it back to what has historically been the biggest question of all. Why is there something instead mm -hmm. of nothing? How you answer that divides the world. Of course, atheism, which is fairly recent development, certainly pure Bach, Nietzsche, and on from there, from the 18th century up to today, it has ebbed and flowed, partly dependent on the communist world. So mm -hmm. again, China putting the brakes on religion in our very day, trying to stop any kind of Christianity, particularly perceived as a Western religion, but even Buddhism and the other religions. At Mao and now Xi Jinping is very determined to have an atheist regime, tightening all the more. So whether in the West or in the East, why is there something instead of nothing? Well, there is no God. And therefore, in some sense, something has always existed. It may be pre-quark, pre-lepton and all the rest, but something does not come out of absolute nothing, though mm -hmm. Stephen Hawking certainly mm -hmm. tried to get it there, but said, no, you're cheating. And so the first answer to that big question, why is there something instead of nothing, is, well, it's all occurred by pure chance. And though there is no external force, there's no cosmos with a capital C or mother nature, yet here we are. There's no reason for our existence and that existence could be short-lived, as some of the AI people today mm. prophesying. Second answer to that question, why is there something instead of nothing, is really that of pantheism. And pantheism says everything is God, and God is everything. And the irony of Buddhism is, in a way, it straddles those two. And we might say Hinduism, but Hinduism is kind of everything. So it is Advaita, that is non-dualism, 
Finally, everything is simply one. We might call it God or the Einstein particle that Albert Einstein called, I guess, God. Or it could be a Brahman that globes all different things as they emanate in and out trillions of reincarnative mm. cycles. The third answer to why is there something instead of nothing is, well, there is a personal God who created the universe out of nothing. It didn't exist before. He created it, sustains it, and has purpose in it all. The second big question is, why human beings? Why are we here? And of course, atheism would say, well, we don't know. There is no reason, finally. Pantheists, kind of the same. We are a higher level of karma realization and, and the reincarnative cycle. But finally, everything is one. It doesn't matter. But of course, in monotheism, we've been created by God. The Muslim would say to be servants, to worship. The Christian would say, well, yes, but also we've been created to have real relationship with God. We have different from Islam and created in his image. So today we're talking about Buddhism, of course, and Buddhism officially claims to be atheistic, though many don't function that way. You know, there's even trying to mimic Christianity. Yes, Buddha loves me. Yes, Buddha loves me. I'm not sure who tells them so, but it's hard to be purely atheistic. So the vast majority of Buddhism around the world, while claiming that the final reality is nothingness, have a vast array of gods and demons and bodhisattvas, which are the enlightened ones, and spirits and ancestral spirits. So those who claim to be Buddhist on a global scene have a very full universe of other beings, but yet the final reality, they claim, would be absolute nothingness. So there we are. The big picture, I guess you'd say. Yes, and so our listeners who've been paying attention and listening to the last episodes, and when we talked about Hinduism, we talked about how it did not adapt and how it didn't proselytize very well, how there are certain criteria that relate to the culture and the caste system that prohibited it from developing and growing in other countries. Buddhism isn't like that, right? We see that it expands and is very fluid and acceptable in many different forms, and we'll talk about some of those reasons, won't we? Well, they had an emperor who converted to Buddhism, Ashoka, around 250 through there before Christ, and he popularized it in India and began to push it west. And it first of all went into what we call Afghanistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan, later cycled around via the Silk Road into China and so forth. It did go to Sri Lanka and to Southeast Asia, directly out of India, Nepal. It has especially, Paul, exploded in the 19th century and 20th. Mm -hmm. So all kinds, new kinds of Buddhism have come into being since around 1910, 1920. And frankly, in the last 12 years or so has exploded as well. I was just at a humanist Buddhist center called Humanist Buddhism. This began in 2012. Mm -hmm. Or as we look at Falun Gong, beginning in 1992, or a number of other forms are very new as mm -hmm. they are becoming popular on a global level. And we might add, because that Buddhism sort of is religious and yet technically atheistic, mm. it speaks to the atheists in Europe. When you look at a Nietzsche or others and the utterly dreadful, meaningless, mm. despair-ridden world, and says, this all there is. Right. So many, of course, committing suicide, even. That Buddhism comes in and says, well, there really is no God, but you can have peace and mm -hmm. happiness, profound joy by following Buddhism. So it has become a, I think, European and even U.S. elite mm. option right. for many. And it gives a facade of peace, but not real lasting peace, does it? Yeah. It's not possible to tell the story of Buddhism without mentioning the name Siddhartha Gautama. Who is Siddhartha? What do we know about him? Yeah, what do we know about him? We know what has been passed down through tales, even as to when he lived. Typically, his lifespan is put it between born in 563 before Christ and dying around 480, so 400 years before Christ. But another whole tradition of, and highly respected as well, of Buddhism has it 100 years later. He was born in 483 and died around 400. And yet, when we look at China and other places like that, many will say, well, no, he died in 949. And another tradition in South Central Asia puts it somewhere around 833 that he died. So we're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years difference, even in the basic chronology of his life. 
So what is authoritative about Siddhartha Gautama's life? The scholars I read sort of toss up their hands and say, well, just about nothing. Maybe there's a trajectory we'll talk about, but it has been so like a, a little snowball rolling down a hill, so many accretions of myth and fable and imaginative thinking that nobody quite knows for sure other than an enlightenment period. I think that's been a wealthy beginning. But what can we say about Siddhartha Gautama Buddha? Actually, in high school, I took an English class and they had us read the supposed life of Siddhartha. But of course, how much of that is legend? How much of it is real? Was it Hermit Hesse's Siddhartha, um, which was the Bible of my generation in the 60s? I think so. Well, Hess it was a philosopher. That was one of his many books, mm -hmm. Steppenwolf and Damien and all these others. But that work on Siddhartha, if that's the one you read, is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I have my students read it, at least the last mm -hmm. few pages. I suppose this is as close as it gets in a yeah. very fictitious, wonderful way. <laughs> I mean, it's a fascinating read Yeah, as, uh, as anything we know. Well, Siddhartha's story is often divided into three periods of time. So let's talk about those supposed three periods of time. We can use the alliteration of three E's to help us remember them. The first period was characterized by enjoyment, followed by second, a period of inquiry, and then a third period of supposed enlightenment. So please first describe for us the period of enjoyment and along the way help us to distinguish what we think is history, what we think is legendary. Well, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it is widely believed that he was born into nobility, perhaps his father as head over what is sort of bordering Nepal and northern India, and very wealthy. Gautama is the family name. His then given name Siddhartha comes from that. He grew up in a kind of Disney world. It was it was great. I mean, his father, it is said, tried to protect him from the pain and suffering of the world. As a young man, he married a beautiful girl, and they had a little boy, and that was about the time shortly after that that he left in a quest for enlightenment. During that time that he was protected, his father so hoped, from seeing the misery of the world, yet outside castle walls, so to speak, he did begin to see suffering and asceticism, some starving themselves, trying to find some kind of a truth to life beyond just entertainment and enjoyment, so to speak. What was there, we're not sure. There are certainly powerful myths that talk about even him being born from his mother Maya by some supernatural act. Some would even say virgin birth. Others would say, well, a white little elephant was placed within him as sort of the fetus that became Siddhartha. Lots of stories about that, but it was the best of all lives before he began to question it all. This is, he would have been raised in a Hindu tradition? Oh yeah, and it would have been. And so Buddhism steps away from Hinduism, but not as far as a lot of people would like to think. So yes. And Maya, some... Well, that's his mother's right. name, and that, that's also a term for other things as well. In Sanskrit, the world of Maya is the world of illusion, but I don't think the two are connected. And actually where he grew up in India at that time was not really Vedic Hindu. It was kind of a neutral area above the Ganges. And so it was as much controlled by, what do you say, ancestral worship and lots of gods and things of that nature as by what we would consider more mainline ascetic Buddhism. What is important in all this is he began to question the idyllic life that he had. Again, that Disney World life of all pleasure was ebbing in its mm. pleasure for him. Yeah. So we're getting into a lot of challenging territory, right? Because... Like you said from the beginning, we have very little that we can be 100% sure about his life. And the biography of his life took place how many years after his death? Well, the nearest we have is at least 200 years later. It's not like the Gospels where you mm -hmm. have Matthew and John as eyewitnesses and probably mm -hmm. John Mark as well. And of course, Luke drawn from Peter. So it is a very different reality. And, and that's why even the earliest, which would be you know around 250 and probably closer to the time of Christ when it actually estimated around 40 AD, when actually a, a life of Siddhartha was, was at least traced, mm -hmm. even though there are all kinds of variations even then. So we've talked about the period of enjoyment. Now, would you tell us a little bit about this period of inquiry? Yeah, well, radical inquiry. He walked away from his wife and child and sought illumination 
first of all, through asceticism, and if he really was living around 563 down to about 483, Jainism would have just come into popularity as well. In fact, Mahivara, the founder of Jainism, was just a few decades earlier. Jainism in India, there's still Jains today. They're absolute vegetarians, but those that are really separated will, what, only eat rotting vegetables and things like that. It is extreme asceticism. Not many can actually do that, but that was emerging as a religion not far from the same area as well. Out of, he, out of a Hindu tradition as well. Out of a Hindu well. tradition, yeah. Though Jains aren't considered strictly Hindu, but they are kind of a cult of Hinduism. In any case, with Siddhartha, yeah, he set out. You know, I have pictures of him that I show in class, starving himself. And You have a being, picture of him? Well, not of him, <laughs> but of all kinds of paintings of his during that period. And his he, he had a small group of followers as well, being utterly emaciated as a human figure. So the pictures of a heavy... Buddha is not very likely. <laughs> well, that may come with the last part. Representations of Siddhartha Gautama vary to the extreme. In fact, even his name as the Buddha was about 200 years later. It seems that for about six years, he wandered in the forests, and India was heavily forested at that point where he lived, and wandering along the rivers, and of course, eating whatever might have been offered or whatever he could. He did not return home during that time, nor did he after that? I can recall maybe once. So six years of searching and in that hunger and suffering, still not finding answers. In just a moment, we'll return to our previously recorded discussion with Dr. Scott Harrell. But before we do that, I wanted to let you know that if you're listening to this podcast the day of or the week of its release, that being June 8th of 2023, I'm presently in the country of Uganda, teaching a group of Bible college students the Book of Hebrews. These students are from all over East Africa. I'm pleased to have traveling with me a student from Dallas Theological Seminary, Sam Allen, who's my intern. Sam is assisting me this week while also being exposed to the great needs for theological education abroad. We would greatly appreciate your prayers. By the way, I do this voluntarily. The Bible College does not pay me. In fact, I raise funds to cover my traveling costs. If you'd like to help by giving a donation of any amount towards these costs, it would be greatly appreciated. You can do so at fim.org forward slash give forward slash weaver. That's FIM for Fellowship International Mission, fim.org forward slash give forward slash weaver. Thanks for your prayerful consideration. Now back to our previously recorded conversation with Dr. Scott Harrell. So he's seen pain and death and asceticism and wanting to know why all this exists, and he's not found the answers. He's not. And so he came to that, what is called his enlightenment, and sitting under a bodhi tree, which is practically revered by all Buddhists mm. today, and the one he supposedly sat under in Uttar Pradesh in northern India is a mm. massive shrine. The most holy place to visit for well, Buddhists. His, it, it could well be, yeah. And under any Buddha, tree is a, considered approaching the experience of later called the Buddha. It was there alongside a river, as we're usually told, and he began to realize that there's a middle way, that on the one hand, affluence and pleasure, enjoyment, as you said, the life of absolute abjection and poverty also was not the way of life. So he came to an enlightenment, a middle way, where he began to realize the foundational truth of Buddhism. Foundational truth is that suffering is the reality of all the world. And we suffer, that's principle number one of Buddhism, we suffer because we desire. To live is to suffer. Principle number one, to put it quite blatantly as they do. Number two, suffering is caused by desire. Any desire, even the enjoyment of marrying a young maiden and all of that, and having a child, but time goes on. Desire and enjoyment inverts and becomes pain and suffering for a myriad of reasons as well. So desiring anything finally inverts to its opposite. Therefore, principle number three is that we can eliminate suffering by eliminating desire. And comes the Eightfold Path. But that is said to be his enlightenment, and his disciples began to find that true as well. Just to summarize what we've talked about so far, we've talked about a period of time where he has a lot of affluence, wealth, virtual royalty, yes. yes. Then a period of time of asceticism and 
now he's choosing what's called the middle way. And you've given the four details or four teachings of the middle way, right? The yeah. first one being suffering exists. To exist is to suffer. Second, to do away with suffering, you must do away with desire. Yeah. Third. Well, the third one is eliminate yes, suffering by desire and desire. And to do that, then you follow what is usually called the Eightfold Path of Purity. So the four, four steps <clears throat> goes into eight. Yes. It blossoms the, into... The fourth does, uh, yes. And there's an irony there because you have to desire to do that too. <laughs> so it's often... So the middle way is known as the Four Noble Truths. Is that right? It would be, yes. Okay. Yeah. So not seeking any of that. And expanding on that a little bit, a number of things come to mind. Number one is what later his disciples were asking him, as Houston Smith puts it, there were only two religious figures in all of history where the disciples asked, who are you? Or mm -hmm. what are you? In the case of Siddhartha Gautama. And they said, are you a god? No. Are you an angel? No. Well, what are you? And he responded the Sanskrit term, I am awakened, which is the Buddha. Mm -hmm. And so the awakened one, the enlightened one, that implies that he has been sleeping and that everybody else has been sleeping. As one Tokyo Buddhist scholar put it, he believed that his enlightenment transcended above all the gods, so that even they needed to be enlightened by what he had experienced. Hmm. Buddhism doesn't deny gods, it just makes any final god irrelevant, ironically. So typically it's considered an atheist religion. And when asked, what is God? He wouldn't answer, he'd just stay in silence. And then finally pressed by his disciples, well, he's not this, he's not that. It's just nothingness, finally. And nothingness isn't the horrific nothingness of Nietzsche. So there's nothing finally out there. There's no reason for anything. For the Buddhist and for Siddhartha Gautama, it is the realization that this life is impermanent, that there is nothing finally there. So stop and become content with the life in its moment that you have. So for Buddhism, there is no soul, there is no self, there is no God, so of course there's no sin. So we're really talking in some ways the polar opposite of a theistic and Trinitarian faith, and a Muslim faith as well. So the goal of Buddhism is to do away with desire. Yes. So the, the problem of suffering, as a Christian, we'd say you got the problem wrong. The consequence is suffering. The problem is sin. Yes. And he said he misdiagnosed the problem from the beginning, and the result is eightfold path. Yeah. It is interesting that some like Bart Ehrman want to say the same thing today, that the biggest problem of life is suffering. And I want to ask, how do you even know that? Mm -hmm. What do you compare that to? Where there are a myriad of other things that come in to a worldview before you get to that point. What is reality? Who am I as a human being? How do I know right and wrong, suffering from non-suffering? Does an ant know that? You know, does a, a bee or other animals, they may suffer with a bloody end of some kind as a, as a lion attacks an antelope, whatever it might be. But to say the primary reality of life is suffering, I find, I find very strange. And yet mm. that is the absolute foundation of Buddhism. It's interesting when Paul in Acts 14 is preaching out in Lystra and Derby, he says, this very God who gives you, you know, the rain and the sunshine and your crops and your happiness and laughter, this is a God we're proclaiming to you. How interesting. Mm. Certainly Siddhartha Gautama would say quite the opposite. There's no God there that provides that. So we have the middle way. That middle way involves these four noble truths. And the goal of that is to get rid of suffering by getting rid of desire. Yeah, it is. Maybe I can walk through that a little bit more. The Eightfold Path, it's called, well, pure faith, pure will, pure words, pure action, pure work, pure attention, so that we are attentive to what we're looking at, pure memory, that is to have a right mind and meditating properly for the Buddhist, and finally, pure meditation. But by pure we as Christians front load that word pure with holiness or righteousness or uprightness. That's outside the Buddhist way of thinking. For them, purity means just concentration. That is pushing away all else and having a singularity of life, thought, words, meditation, and on from there. That Eightfold Path and 
typically that's the path of the monks for the majority of the Buddhist world, not, not everyday life, which is really quite different, isn't it? Ruben Habitu mm. has written many books, and he is head of spirituality, well, at least until recently, at Southern Methodist University. And yet he combines Catholicism, but especially into Buddhist Mm -hmm. belief and that belief system. And of course, this is a historically Christian school, Southern Methodist. Oh, it wasn't at SMU, though. It's okay. off in another part of the city. Okay. And it, it is the Habito, I think he even calls it a Christian Buddhist center. Even though Buddhism is as far from Christian faith as you can get, ironically, the big names in world religions, at least from the 80s, 90s, and into 2000s, Houston Smith and Ninian Smart, they call themselves Buddhist Christians or Christian Buddhists, combining the good of Buddhism, which sees this life as transient and the values that people seek after is all in passing. Well, our Lord would have said something to that effect as well. Don't seek this life. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life, but for my sake, will save it. So there are some similarities, but massive differences as well. But we see a number trying to combine the two as Habitu, again, Ninian Smart, Houston Smith, and a number of others. More recently, there's been something of a reaction against that. Stephen Prothero at Boston University, he's been kind of the inter-religion religionist scholar of the last decade, and his works, uh, God is Not One, arguing against the basic idea that all religions lead to God. Rather, he's saying, no, the concepts of God, the concepts of the worldviews all around him, what is man, what's the basis of values and, and right and wrong and our own personalities and so much more are absolutely different. Prothero uh, goes through eight religions in his book, and uh, he finds that Islam is the most important religion in the world. Interesting. So... As you've alluded to here as well, that Buddhism can be fluid, but that's not the strict Buddhism we've been talking about, right? The strict Buddhism we've been talking about with the middle way and the and the four noble truths and the eightfold oh. path. The eightfold path, that's pretty strict as to what you should do and shouldn't do, what type of career that helps people and doesn't harm them the way you think. But that that would be the most strictest form of Buddhism that follows the teachings of Buddha directly. Yes, and that would be especially what's called Theravada Buddhism, which is, again, uh, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, at least traditionally, Burma, Myanmar, Sri Lanka. That's where you see that more conservative, called the narrow, narrow path or the small vehicle, uh, Buddhism in its uh, strictest form today. It's gone very different, as you know, all over the world now in a multiplicity of forms. Let me kind of put it into several synopses of mainline Buddhism. First of all, the world we experience is transient, ever-changing. Final reality is, beyond all of that, nothingness. They would say kind of a beautiful, blissful nothingness. No God exists. Secondly, then, good and evil are false distinctions that we impose on reality. Reality transcends reason and transcends good and evil. As one bodhisattva put it, the distinction between good and evil is sickness of mind. Wow. Well, the Buddha, or Siddhartha Gautama, is an enlightened teacher. There, in much of Buddhism, there are believed that there are various Buddhas before Siddhartha Gautama. Certainly in Hinduism, that's believed, with avatars and other wise men, and they sort of fit Gautama Buddha into their own worldview as well. The Hindu does. But in Buddhism, he is the enlightened teacher whose example shows the way to nirvana, to bliss within, to escape samsara, the cycles of life, and to enter into, well, ultimate nothingness. Jesus in all of that is sort of one of those wise sages who came to the East, some of them will say, and uh, Jesus' understanding was distorted by Christian myths, they will say. Well, so for Buddhism, self again Personal consciousness is constantly changing. Nothing remains the same. You are a nexus, a knot, K-N-O-T, of relationships and circumstances around you, and that is constantly changing. And when you die, there's nothing there. So the solution to all of that, then, is uh, the Eightfold Path, trying to purify yourself from all desire and live in the moment and recognize everything is in passing. And by that self-effort, one may eliminate attachment to desires, 
which lead to then enlightenment and non-being, kind of an awe-existence. So after death, though, uh, Buddhism varies quite a lot, but all are either reincarnated, that they picked up from Hinduism, back into this world for another round of suffering and pain, or one attains nirvana, the, the cessation of all finitude, cessation of all consciousness, and that is considered the highest happiness. It's not very encouraging and uplifting. The goal is to stop existing, to cease to exist, right? Yeah, or to enter into the final reality of all existence, which is exactly that. And so this is the strictest form talked about the Mahayana, which is the greater vehicle. We've been talking yeah. more about the Theravada, the lesser vehicle. Well, I think what I'm saying it would apply to all forms of Buddhism. The Theravada would be focusing on the lesser vehicle that'd be devotion like a monk and nuns and those that are devoting yeah. entirely to these eight. And those eightfold yeah, steps would especially mark them. But mm -hmm. places like Taiwan and elsewhere also uh, certainly have Buddhists that dedicate themselves to those things. But they're more likely to yes. escape right. and experience enlightenment than you and I if we devoted yeah. to Buddhism but didn't take on these very strict way of living. Yeah. And I've seen some films where, you know, they go into a monastery and here's a monk doing all he knows how for the Eightfold Path. And yet after 20 years has never experienced enlightenment. He keeps trying and trying and trying, yet to no avail in his own life. All forms of Buddhism say that the Siddhartha Gautama is merely the example of what all of us can be and should be. I mean, in almost every Buddhist temple, I've been in a number of them, and sometimes there's just hundreds and hundreds of Buddhas, little statues all around, and they'll say, we don't worship Buddha. That's our example of enlightenment. So we seek to emulate his path to being enlightened as well. And that would apply to Mahayana, the broader uh, group collection of uh, Buddhism, as well as the narrow. So if Buddha attained enlightenment or nirvana, ceased to exist, but he chooses to come back and to help others to attain that same nirvana. Yeah, that's what a bodhisattva is. Like Siddhartha Gautama, he could have transcended and left this life, but he chose to come back to show compassion and show others the way. So there are thousands of bodhisattvas that have apparently attained enlightenment, so they claim, and yet have not left so that they may need others. You've shared a paradox that goal is to get rid of desire, but that requires the desire to get rid of desire. Right? <laughs> it is. There are some ironies here, but uh, that's part of our problem, Paul. We think, we reason, we philosophize, and that's a huge problem in all Buddhism because truth transcends reason in every way. And so as in Zen, but many other forms, you have what are called koans, or mm -hmm. you know the, the discipline of asking questions that have no answer. Mm. I was just reading a little about that before I came in here, too, and now the greatest answer is no answer at all. Mm. No, no, popular one is, what is the sound of one hand clapping? But there's 500 or more, 600 different, li the list is infinite from there, but questions that cannot be answered, and if you try to answer, have not arrived. And they're okay with those paradoxes. That's the pathway to life. It is living the emptiness of reality. I should throw in one more thing here, Paul. At least it is said by some sources that Siddhartha Gautama died at 83 years of age of dysentery after eating a pork meal. Not at all parallel with uh, our Lord on the cross. Well, our time is up for today's program, but we are far from finished discussing the subject of Buddhism. So please join us again for the next episode. Dr. Harrell will return to the Bible and Theology Matters podcast to continue our discussion. In it, we will discuss different variations of Buddhism, why Buddhism has become so popular, and why Hollywood elites have gravitated towards it. And finally, some suggestions on how to reach a Buddhist with the Gospel of Christ. You will not want to miss it. Before we sign off, I'd like to ask you to like the episode and subscribe to this podcast wherever it is that you listen to this program. And would you share it with a friend who would benefit from it or share it on one of your social media platforms? This will help us to make this content available to those who are searching for faith-building programming. But until next time, never forget, Bible and theology matters because what you really believe determines how you really behave. Thank you.
Bible and Theology Matters podcast is a listener-supported podcast devoted to helping Christians grow in their knowledge of the Word of God and in their relationship to the God of the Word. To learn how you can partner with the Bible and Theology Matters podcast, visit us at BibleAndTheologyMatters.com. That's Bible, A-N-D, TheologyMatters.com.